Well, hello, everybody. I'd like to thank Professor Larry Gibbs from the Sociology Department for taking time to come in today. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Bill. Thanks for asking. How are you doing? I am well. Yes, everything's under control. <laughs> I can fill out that form when we come online with, nope, uh, temperature's good, not coughing, not sneezing, just great. Wow, that's good. That's I'm not good. dead yet. I'm getting better, I guess, is the old Monty Python joke. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when we kind of got this idea together, you told me some, a story that you folks were doing in the department that I thought was really interesting. Could you take a minute and share that with us, please? Yes, I can. So at the beginning of the spring term, we were told we'd get an extra week of uh, spring break in order to prepare for mm -hmm. students coming in. And that was kind of at the first thrust, really, of the COVID. So we recognized shortly that, you know, we needed to learn on a fly. Uh, yes. Many of us have not had the opportunity to teach remotely or online. So the chair decided, let's have a weekly meeting at the start of the spring term. Originally, we would have met once um, per month. So that would be three times for the spring term. So we decided let's meet every Friday for an hour. And there are certain goals in mind for that meeting. One, to kind of catch up on each other as faculty. How are you doing? How are you learning Zoom? And you know, mm. how are you putting persons in the waiting room? Um, yeah. Ideas, how do you your Google Sheets? Um, all of those issues. So one, to kind of get a, an idea from, from faculty. How are we doing? How are we coping as faculty? Right. The second one was, how are our students coping? What are some things that we are doing to reach out to our students? And I, I shared a story with them that I had the privilege of having students actually outside of the U.S. Ah. Teaching in the spring. So think about me teaching a student who had to get up early morning to get into my remote class at 1030. So I realized uh, shortly that I had to do a little bit more for that particular student. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I shared that with my, my faculty. I also reached out to that student and, and made some alternative arrangements actually for that student to meet me um, in their time on their ah, schedule. So the, I nice. my remote schedule for one particular student. Um, and of course, with that comes challenges. The student uh, took advantage of that, but you know, over time that waned. But we had to start thinking outside the box. And my faculty, they encouraged me as well to say, you know, that's a good idea. So that weekly meeting was fantastic. And then during the weekly Friday meetings, another faculty member said, hey, let's just take a pause. We're talking about a lot of work related stuff. Let's just do a non Friday faculty meeting where we can invite our spouses or partners or children and we can have a meal, we can be sharing our screens. And we did just that. So it, it was kind of a potluck, but it was kind of a faculty gathering with family. So it was like a faculty family uh, potluck. And so we enjoyed that approach. And so I think that was worthwhile for um, us as faculty. And it was also worthwhile because we we're able to bounce ideas to impact our students in a more effective manner. You know, this has been new for all of us, students and faculty alike. And so we understand that the challenges are varied for students. As I said, having one student living outside of the US, other students with different zone, um, time zones. Exactly. You know, relating, relating with that was a challenge, but we, we stuck it through. Um, another another um, activity that we did, um, and again, kudos to my chair, Dr. Shibley. He decided post spring 2020, as a faculty, we decided to have a evening every Friday by his patio. You could just pop by. And so we were social distancing, we were wearing masks, you know, just light orders, and just being able to talk, you know, being out in the air, being out of the house. But exactly. Sitting by and, and share for a minute, and then you, you go home, but just being able to 
see a familiar face um, was always helpful. And, and so those were the things that, you know, from a work standpoint, I did in order to kind of cope along with my colleagues. Things are changing really, really significantly sociologically. There's so many things happening, and we could do two hours on just listing the changes. How does it feel as a professor to be in the midst? I mean, often we read about these changes or we say, oh, this change is coming. Right now, we're, it's happening. It's taking place right now. As a professor, what's that feel like to you? Because it's a sociological change that's going to impact the rest of my life. Wow. That, that's a two-hour question, Bill, because <laughs> and don't hold this against me. No, no. I'm a sociologist, but I'm a demographer by training. So epidemiology and these issues, I speak to sometimes. Oh, okay. And ironically, at the beginning of winter 2020, I was teaching a class in epidemiology, talking about epidemics, pandemics, when the coronavirus, COVID-19 struck. So I was teaching a course in real time to my 16 or 17 students, having them walk through this process, having them understand terms that um, were floating in the media. Right. So from a sociological standpoint, they were seeing the issues structurally, institutionally. They were understanding issues relating to disparities. You know, they were understanding issues relating to health care mm-hmm. and, and how persons were, were not all advantageous um, in, in a sense. So they were learning issues on a fly. Um, so that was kind of humbling because here I am teaching students pandemics and then COVID hits. So that changed my whole teaching approach. I now had to be changing my content. Oh, instantly. Yeah, that's just like, (laughs) I had to be, you know, coming up, doing research. So now, having prepped for the course, I'm re-prepping in a term to ensure that my students are getting the most up-to-date, valid, correct, substantiated reports on this issue on a fly. So, so you're just doing everything in pencil. You're not even typing <laughs> anything. So you my, erase my, it there. That's my all right. PowerPoints, my PowerPoints went out the window. Yep. Literally, I was prepping each day up to class time. Because wow. as, as, as you would have been aware, when things were changing from a state level, I had to be getting that information. Mm-hmm. I had to be on, I, I lived on CDC. Because everything that changed, I had to be informing my students, giving them the websites, giving them the information. Um, Tracking it down, yeah. So that, that, was, that was one aspect sociologically of seeing, you know, culture change, of seeing the dynamics of undergraduate education change, of seeing how students taking a course in epidemiology realized the severity of what was being taught because they were living through COVID now. Right. And also sociologically appreciating the value of education. And that carried over for the spring term when I also taught a course in the sociology of healthcare. Because teaching healthcare, I now got a chance to explore what is called the social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. And all the disparities that you hear floating around with COVID from a racial standpoint, Sure. I now had to be guiding my students along to really showing them this is not only textbook, but here we have it in real time. In 2020, you're seeing it firsthand without a textbook. And you can walk right out, the, go see it on the patio. There it is. You know, when, when we think of how many persons could have access to testing or going to see a doctor or mm-hmm. being able to leave their home, when we think sociologically of the impact it has on employment and relationship dynamics, many of the students had to return home and, and the struggles they had being back home because we make assumptions sometimes that, you know, you're going back home, it's all dandy and you're going to be in your room and you're going to be on Zoom and you're going to learn. You know, it was, yeah. it, it came full force, the challenges that our students were facing. And then, you know, we have to talk about this. During the COVID 
then we are hit again with the recurring theme of racial tensions. Exactly. So when the racial tensions hit, now you'll have to speak to that as well because it's all intersected, all related. You couldn't dissect COVID from the racial tensions because again, the, the, the most vulnerable groups are the minorities. So exactly. here we have a perfect storm when we're delivering courses online, which is already challenging when we think mm -hmm. of the digital divide and the inequalities with digital divide. And we're talking about real national and global issues all in one mix. So for me, sociologically, it was eye-opening because no students were able to ask me questions. They were mm -hmm. saying, Dr. Gibbs, how do you feel when mm -hmm. these issues are happening? Sure, you have sure. been in this literature with health and you're seeing it. How, how are you coping? So when students were asking me how I, I was coping, that was humbling. And, and I took several classes just to move away from content. Students needed to speak their minds um, yes. on the COVID. They needed to speak their minds on racial issues. Mm -hmm. And they were so appreciative because, again, we think that, you know, students are in a bubble. They're online. They're going to learn right away. We can't, you know, miss these teachable moments when we're seeing these experiences. And so sociologically, we are seeing cultural shift. Yes. We're seeing movements where normally you would say these are fixed to an age demographic that would be young people. We're seeing a demographic shift where it's everybody, mm -hmm. young to old, you know, everybody related. We're seeing issues when um, culturally it's changed from not only one minority group pushing the cause, but we're seeing everybody join in. More and more. It's yep. We're seeing fine. cultural changes when normal big corporations or corporate sponsors are now engaging in dialogue and supporting things mm -hmm. that they would not necessarily support, say, 20 years ago. Even 10. Culturally, yeah. that's changing. Um, we're seeing a change culturally in our language where now, you know, young people speak a certain way. Of course, they're on the social media. We realize that older people, you know, the baby boomers, they have to now kind of understand the, 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 the language, the dialogue oh, that's yeah. happening, you know. So culturally and sociologically, we have seen a lot of shifts there. Um, a big point, I must say, from a sociological perspective as well, is that my students were able now to really see institutional inequalities. So we teach that in our classes, you know, there are different institutions, whether it's health, whether it's education, whether it's the family, whether it's the political sphere, whether it's the judicial system. And now they're seeing where the inequalities exist. So normally when you're teaching, it can be sometimes abstract. But when you could break it down to say, okay, why is it that some people can't access resources and then you yeah. track it. Why is access limited? Why are rights being suppressed? Why are some groups more likely to succeed than others? Then persons were able to see institutionally, this is a common thread. And therefore, you know, my encouragement to my students sociologically is value the education you're getting because it's all well and good to jump on the social media and to tweet or to, you know, do some Instagram post. But at the end of the day, the value of getting this education is to make yourself more aware so you can be more articulate in um, placing your position um, in terms of a document. Mm -hmm. changes, changes come, we know, um, from a legislative standpoint. So my goal sociologically this term was to say, while these issues are, are really hard to grapple with, we have to live through them. We have to think more in terms of how can we elevate the conversation. And using the education that you have, understanding the sociological changes, understanding that we are all not the same, understanding that some persons are privileged, other persons aren't. How do we use the power that we have in different spheres? Okay, how do we use that power um, to, to educate and to move forward? So it has been really a, a dynamic kind of sociological experiment, if I were to say, but it's all good. No, I really appreciate this. Um, I, I think it's, it's valuable. Um, 
you know, and everything is on a fly. But I really appreciate just hearing, you know, from an instructional standpoint and also what have been our kind of experience with our students as well. I think, I think from a I will. So Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think from a sociological standpoint, Bill, it's very important. I, I'm a, I, I tell my students, they, they tend to ask me, what led you to sociology? Sociology has so many lens that you can apply everything to. Mm -hmm. And the main thrust of sociology is always to say, hey, while we may be different, it's an appreciation of the difference. It's understanding, okay, I'm not in your shoe. I can listen to your perspective. I can see that we're right. different. And how do we come together and, and try to work as best as possible for, for, for a good society? You know, being yes. social agents or agents of change is one of the main objectives of, of, of my role as a sociologist. If students leave my class and they aren't at least given the skill set to effect change, I would have failed. And effecting change looks different. It can be by writing to your editor in the newspaper. It can be by writing an op-ed. It can be by doing a, a, a very academic oriented or really topical video. It can be sparking conversations on, on your social media thread. So when everybody is in a tizzy, you can pull back and you can offer some really sound um, positions for persons to think you know, we're, we're missing that now when persons aren't critical thinkers. And well, they I think, aren't thinking, they're reacting. Yeah. I, mean, I, I have dropped Facebook. I've dropped Instagram. I dropped Twitter two years ago. I've saved two hours a day arguing with artificial bots from the Ukraine. I never get, I got real persons in another political party I disagree with. There is no listening. It is reacting and yeah. the anger. Oh, my yeah. God. The seething no anger. You're absolutely right, Bill. No, we, 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 we have missed that as um, generally as people. We have missed listening. And so we have missed that empathy. We have missed that caring. We have missed thinking critically. We have also missed the, 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 the ability to fail and show grace and to rebound and to yes. respond in a way that brings or encourages restoration and rebuilding and refocus. We have missed those things and, and that's sad, but I think we're on the right path as, as instructors and you know, from a sociological standpoint, I think that's one of my many uh, goals that I have to ensure that I'm completing with each class that I teach. Wow. Well, thank you, my friend. Have an excellent evening. Uh, best to the family and Reach out anytime if you just want to chew the fat. You know, it's, I, I want to keep the personal relationship as well as the uh, professor IT guy, little uh, <laughs> cattle rustler. That's what I am. I'm a cattle baron. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks again, Bill. And you have a good one, too. Thank you. All have right. Bye-bye. Yep.